Hi, I'm Howie Rose, and I'm sitting here with, uh, frankly, one of the best relievers the New York Mets have ever had, and it's always great to see him at City Field or anywhere else, and that is Turk Wendell. And I want to start from the very beginning. How did Steven turn into Turk? Uh, my grandpa when I was about three years old. What was the motivation for that? I just always did a lot of stupid things as a kid. <laughs> and one of the things that I was told, obviously I don't remember when I was three, but I uh, was outside playing on a big snow pile, jumped off, slid down on my face, came up, was bleeding, and my grandpa saw me through the window and jumped up to get his coat on to come out and help me or see if I was okay. And by the time he even got out the door, I was back up doing the same exact thing again. So obviously I wasn't that smart. <laughs> so, but you got away lucky then because after that display, they could have thought of other things to call you other than Turk. Oh, I'm sure. So that's pretty I'm good. I'm sure, yeah, very All lucky. All things considered. And, and you came to the Mets from the Chicago Cubs and really it was a, it was a terrific trade for the Mets. But uh, the thing that most people remember you for, which is kind of unfair because it doesn't even really get into your performance, but they remember the eccentric stuff, the licorice, jumping over the foul line and all that. Uh, did that come about organically as opposed to you considering, I think I want to do this? No, it's just, uh, especially baseball athletes and humans are just humans of habit, creatures of habit, and through success and failure you um, come up with a routine and I just had a really weird routine. <laughs> He is a very talented right-hander with quite a few quirks. Now he should point out to the center fielder. Bingo. Points to the center fielder. Of course, he draws the the crosses. He chews black liquid. And then after every half inning, he goes in, brushes his teeth. Here he goes. Which was the, the craziest for you? Did you continue to brush your teeth between every inning? Um. So now Jim Ruggleman is bench coach with the Mets. He was my manager with the Cubs in 2000, or no, 95. And the very first day of spring training, you know, all the way up to 95, through the 94 season, I would brush my teeth between innings and jump over the foul line and chew black licorice. And first day of spring training, he pulls me aside and says, I don't want you doing any of this stuff anymore. And I thought, God, look at this guy. He's already, he's raining on my parade. This is my first conversation with him. <laughs> But, um, of course, out of respect for the manager and not wanting to disappoint him and wanting to, you know, maintain a job in the big leagues, I obliged. And uh, it, it was a little tough coming up with a, a new routine, and, uh, just as far as, so I said, with athletes getting to the same spot every day, you have to have a routine. It gets you in a comfort zone. And it helped me mature a lot as a player and a person. What's it like for a professional athlete to be somewhat eccentric when most of his teammates are not? Are they easily accepting of your somewhat um, offbeat habits, or did well, that take some convincing? Some of the times, some players that I played with thought, oh, he's doing that for attention or something. But once they got to know me, they just, that's just him. He's just, I don't know, they always say beats my own drum. He's got this place wired. That's it. <laughs> I'll tell you, the opposition's not going to like this, but this is quite a spectacle, reacting to a rosin bag. I'll be the first to admit it, brushing my teeth, this is, that was pretty weird. But I had Consider a bad, it, though. well, I mean, I had a bad taste in my mouth when in rookie ball and asked the bat boy to run up and get my toothbrush and brush my teeth and went out and struck out everybody the next inning, so. So I'm at the end of the day, it was a superstition, uh, in part. Yeah, I guess Based you could say in part, but it wasn't. I, mean, I had a lot of people contact me about, oh, I'm writing a book on OCD. I didn't even know what OCD <laughs> was. And I'm, it's not like I have to do it. And it was just something I did you know, to make myself feel comfortable. The more comfortable you are, the better you're going to perform at whatever it is. You were superstitious because you used to break my chops if I mentioned the pitcher had a no-hitter well, as yeah, far back as the fifth just inning. that's baseball gods. You uh -huh. just never... Um, but there are different ways you know, to say it, too, you know. Oh, there's a lot. Did. Look at the scoreboard. Hey. Yeah. Or uh, we would joke around in the, in the dugout or the bullpen at times. Guys would say, man, this game's flying. <laughs> uh, next thing you know, it's a 45-minute half inning. So you just That's never. That's where shooting the clown. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we always say, hey, the baseball gods are always listening. And for me, um, I guess to totally sum up my career with the baseball gods are only listening, I always said I mean, I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm a huge Red Sox fan. I hate the Yankees. 
I'm a small town guy. Never, I said, never. There's never anything against the Mets, but I just never wanted to play in New York because big city and baseball guys are listening. I get <laughs> traded to the Mets. Best thing that ever happened to me. And if you hated the Yankees, what was it like going into Yankee Stadium and pitching there? Oh, it uh, it, it was just a, an extra fire for me to, to beat them, and uh, especially you know, wanting to beat them in the World Series just because you know, I kind of despised the Yankees my whole life. Good fastball by Wendell. He's got two strikeouts. I have a lot of friends that are Yankee fans, so after we had lost the World Series and uh, Joe Torre came out with a book. I have an. Ep There's some clips in the book about after they were celebrating here in the visiting locker room at Shea, and uh, they said something about every five ten minutes someone would raise their glass and say, "This one's for Tur." <laughs> <laughs> so just putting a little more salt in the wound. Yeah, but that also added some color and flair to a game that sometimes is criticized for not having enough of it. So did you mind that at all? Uh, no, I mean. I guess fortunately, but unfortunately, I'm just kind of a guy that says it how it is, and mm -hmm. some people take it one way, and some people maybe take it the other. Well, I know you remember the World Series in 2000 for just what it was, the pageantry, the excitement, but let's go back a couple of years before that, because when I think of you as a reliever for the Mets, I think of A, a bulldog, and B, and maybe B should be A, but one series in particular which was when the Mets were in contention for a wild card spot down the stretch in 1998. And you were pitching every day and extremely effectively out of the bullpen to the point where you guys got to Houston for a big series in September. And Bobby Valentine would say prior to every game, I don't have Turk today. I can't run him out <laughs> there today. And then you'd get into a big spot, bullpen phone would ring, I guess they would check on you. Was there ever a time that you said, oh, no, not today? Because you took the ball every day when most relievers would never pitch that often. Yeah, that was, uh, I don't know how many innings I threw, but it was in the, the Houston series, I can remember, because we had a doubleheader and then a day game. And um, I threw nine straight games, which I, don't, I think may still be a record for the Mets. I don't know. Nowadays, a manager would be sued for that. Oh, by yeah, the players but I think in those nine games, consecutive games, I threw... Um, like 24 innings or something. It'll be a payoff pitch. Put it in the box. Turk Wendell strikes out the side, and the Mets win it. And I felt I felt great. And I remember John Franco and Al Leiter sitting next to me on the bus and, and, and say, how do you feel? I mean, you better tell them you can't throw today because your arm's going to yeah. fall off. And I remember looking at Al and go, I play when they tell me to play. That's what I get paid to do. And, I mean, I, I looked forward to playing every day. That's what I trained for, mentally and physically. And you pitched effectively for several years after that. So were there any ramifications of that big workload that took a toll a year or two down the line that may have been too subtle for most of us to see? You have to be ready for when they call down and say, be ready for two, three hitters, it's a righty if he gets in trouble. And then it's first and second and there's you know you're one batter away. And then the guy gets out of the inning. So then they call down and say, sit down get up next inning when he goes out to take the mound in case he gets in trouble again. So you do that three or four times in a game, it really wears its toll on, on your arm. It taxes your arm more than anybody can understand because you can't just get ready half halfway there. I mean, you gotta be ready. And, you know, unfortunately, I think I warmed up six times before game one of the World Series when I got in and I think it was the 11th inning or something. Of course, first game of the World Series, you're super excited, your adrenaline's pumping, and I was pretty shot. But, I mean, looking back on it, I came in and got out of a jam. I might have should have said, hey, you know what, I got out of that jam. You might want to get someone else. But, I mean, I just, uh, that was my competitiveness. And it certainly showed, particularly in that series in Houston, what you used to show, whether it had anything to do with pitching or not, was that famous necklace of yours <laughs> with what, uh, some people might have thought it was puka shells, but sharks they, teeth, yeah, puka they shells, were, all that. It was, that there's no sharks teeth. There's never no been sharks teeth. No. That's so. That's a, an urban legend. I I don't even know where it came from. No puka well, shells. There, I still have a couple ivory elk teeth. Um, that was bear claws on there, mountain lion claws, turkey spurs. <laughs> it was just a kind of a tribute to um, things that I was fortunate enough to to bag. Hunting. And. You know, nowadays, and heck, even then and probably before that, as 
jewelry became more a part of players' uh, wardrobes on the field. You know, if somebody was wearing a chain that might have been a little too bright or potentially distracting to the hitters, the umpire would say, you got to take that off. Did you ever have an umpire say to you, A, what is that, and B, get it off? Never. Not once. Mm -hmm. And I would have been fortunate because I would have had to take it off, but, I mean, the rules are the rules. Well, one thing that people also will remember Turk Wendell for is his uniform number. He wore number 99. Now, you think of a professional athlete wearing 99, and it starts with Wayne Gretzky, and there aren't a whole lot other than that, and obviously in football, because of the numbers they wear, that's somewhat common. But how did you come to 99? Well, when I got traded to the Mets, Edgardo Alfonso had 13, and I had 13 in Chicago, and that's my favorite number is 13. And I remember talking with Jay Horowitz when I got traded over here, and the conversation came up of, I said, Jay, what, what number did, that, did Alfonso give me 13? Because I think Fonzie was a rookie at the time, and I had more service time, so usually out of respect, the, the player with less service time gives them the number. And uh, so anyway, he said, no, Fonzie wouldn't give you 13. Uh, we gave you number 10. And I said, 10? He goes, yeah, why, well, you don't like 10? And I, I didn't have a clue about a number other than 13. And I thought that was one of the coolest things for me as a big leaguer walking into the Cubs locker room for the first time as a major leaguer and seeing my number and my name on my jersey hanging in my locker. But anyway, obviously Fonzie was a heck of a lot better ball player than I was and became. I don't even know where 99 came from. I just thought, hey, 99's a cool number. And Jay said, well, that's pretty messed up. You got it. <laughs> and 99 it became. It became, and ultimately it went when you were traded by the Mets to the Philadelphia Phillies. What was it like leaving? It was pretty surreal. It was like watching a movie, but being in the movie as maybe the main character, I guess I would consider myself the main character of my movie. So, uh, and just walking to the other clubhouse and having um, Jeff Wolpon and, and Bradley, his son, come to the clubhouse, because I did a lot of stuff with Bradley when he, I would take him on the field for batting practice mm -hmm. and everything. And uh, say so he was sorry because he traded me. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it bummed me out a lot because I, I loved playing here. I took a lot less money to stay here. That year I was a free agent prior. And it became really, I mean, bluntly, it just sucked because my loyalty to the Mets it, and then trading me was, was a real shock. So how did you sort of overcome that, assuming you did? Now you go pitch in Philadelphia when your heart is in one place, but your uh, arm and it your was job tough. is somewhere else. It was tough. I remember coming and I pitched that day the very next day we, we got traded Friday night Dennis Cook and I to the Phillies pitched the next day I give up a walk-off homer to Rob Ventura first time in a Philly uniform Turk Wendell now a Philly serves it up his old team has won it four to three as 99 and I said I need to get rid of 99 because Mitch Williams was the last guy to wear oh, that yeah. for yeah. Philly and lost the World Series on a three-run homer but um I remember getting the final out the inning before Robin hit the home run, and I started to run towards the Mets dugout because I wasn't used to running to the third base side of the dugout here at Chase Stadium. Um, Must have really made the Philly fans love you from the beginning. Oh yeah, when you got well, back to Philadelphia. And then that's when my my arm had I had a, ended up having a flexor tendon tore off the bone, and I was trying to pitch through it. Again, competitiveness, you know. I got lots of lots of hate mail in Philadelphia. Well, there's more competitiveness in the Wendell family to talk about because Wyatt may have a big league career someday. Tell us about Wyatt, where he's playing, and what the um, future is. You think he's uh, he's holding his own, making his own name for himself. He's in Indian Hills, uh, Iowa, a junior college. Um, right now he's he's only he's three and three. He's taking a couple a lump, couple lumps, but that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's he's. I mean, I think he has what it takes after seeing and, and getting to the big leagues and knowing what it takes. He definitely, definitely has what it takes. He's, his velocity is only around 90 miles an hour right now. And it, I mean, but he's 6'5", 200 pounds. So, he, I mean, I think that will come and, and, you know, it just keeps working at it. And basically, what's life like for Turk Wendell these days? Uh, well, I moved from Colorado to Iowa. I call it retiring all over again. Got a little farm there. And just uh, even slowing down the slower pace of life I've had, 
Um, I just live life to the fullest every day. I chase my daughter. She's a soccer player at Mankato. She was an All-American last year. And it's just, you know, watching my kids grow. And, I mean, life is good. Turk, it's great seeing you nice back here in New York. Too, huh? And Turk's a regular at Fantasy Camp. If you ever get a chance to participate in that during uh, January, that is one of the great weeks you'll ever have in your life. I'm Howie Rose. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.